good morning, good morning, everyone. I think we're ready to start. Uh, we're on a bit of a tight schedule since there are other parallel sessions, uh, so we need to keep the timing. Welcome to this session on the Financial Stability Board Task Force, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Um, it's good to see so many of you here. Um, of course, climate change uh, is uh, a really important issue uh, now for the PRI and uh, also reflected in the fact that we uh, moved from an 8.30 a.m. time slot last year to 9.30 this year. It shows you how much higher on the agenda this is. Um, I, uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of background for the task force, also for those of you who may not be familiar with all the details, uh, and update you a little bit on the work that the PRI is doing on promoting the task force work. Paul will say a few words on how the CDP is integrating the task force into reporting, and then Jane will lead us through uh, some discussions uh, on around the table and a poll. It would be useful if you could just uh, fire up your cell phones and the app so that you're ready to participate in the polls uh, later on. So, um, our signatories, we ask the signatories what they're concerned about and signatories uh, really say that climate change is now high on their agenda as investors. Um, and the task force, uh, was established uh, around the time of the uh, COP21 in Paris. It's industry-led, it's both the preparers of data and the users, i.e. the investors, came together to look at how we could enhance the quality of climate-related financial disclosures. And the recommendations are structured around four core areas. It's governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets. So to put this in a little context, I think it's useful to think about the kinds of issues that investors will need to address uh, when looking at the climate issue. We all know that we have to move from a carbon-based to a no, no zero-carbon energy system. So we know that we need to make a big transition of our energy system. Um, and what we don't know is the extent to which that transition will happen through transformation of existing companies or by building down existing companies and building up new ones. For investors, this is a really crucial issue. If you think that an existing company is able and willing to transform itself to be a winner in a low carbon economy, you as an investor would probably be happy with letting that company reinvest the money that they're making today in their own business. If you don't believe that a company will be able to make that transition, as an investor you would be pushing for higher dividends now so you can get money out of the company and reinvest in, a comp in a, uh, another company that you think is more likely to survive and make money, uh, create value for you as a shareholder in a low carbon economy. And this framework is actually designed to help you answer exactly that question. It focuses on the resilience of corporate strategy in the face of climate change and climate policies. Um, and uh, I think Jane will particularly emphasize the role of stress testing um, and really uh, because that is the way in which we think about uh, measuring the resilience of corporate strategy in the light of these changing circumstances. So there are a lot of existing uh, reporting frameworks that relate to climate and in the task force work we start, try to take stock of existing uh, reporting frameworks. Uh, we identified around 400 of them globally, so that's quite a lot. Um, if I'm, and this is very uh, oversimplified, but broadly speaking, a lot of the existing frameworks focus a lot on the effect that companies have on the climate through their emissions. 
And I think they, to a large extent, come from the point of view of accountability, trying to hold companies accountable for their contributions to climate change. This framework is different because it asks not how companies affect the climate, but how climate change and climate policies affect the companies financially. So it has that strong investor focus, and I believe a strong investor relevance. So how will we, um, it, from the side of the PRI, support the implementation of this framework? Well, we have at the PRI a collaborative engagement platform where you as investors can come together and engage with companies you've invested in. So we will use this platform to engage with companies to get them to report according to this framework so that you as investors can get better access to more relevant data to help you make good investment decisions in this time of transition. But we also need to look at investment practices among investors. We need not just to get the data, but we need to understand how we can use the data meaningfully. How do you, suppose you get a stress test from a company showing something about the resilience of their strategy. How do you incorporate that into your own investment decisions? How do you interpret those uh, reports that you will be getting? So it's not just about getting the reports, but also about using them. So we will uh, work on that, and we will work, of course, through the uh, more regulatory side and through our cooperation with the stock exchanges on how we can uh, incorporate the task force recommendations into investor, uh, or sorry, uh, disclosure guidance. Um, I'd like to highlight some work that uh, has been done and is uh, posted on our website. Uh, it's a uh, PRI Baker McKenzie country reviews where we wanted to assist investors in understanding how these recommendations map against existing regulations for companies and investors. Um, so you might think that, well, there's something new about reporting on climate risk. My view is that all reporting standards that I know of have requirements to disclose material risks. And these risks are material to many companies. So in that sense, the TCFT recommendations are really not about changing the concept of materiality. These risks are material risks, and they should be disclosed. It's about providing a more standard, standardized, unified framework to get that reporting in a way that's meaningful, comparable, useful for investors. And um, the findings of, of these reports uh, is really that the task force recommendations will assist in implementing existing regulations on material risks. We also have a reporting and assessment framework. Uh, so we will look at how we can implement the task force recommendations in our own reporting and assessment framework. Um, and we will align our indicators on strategy and governance with these task force recommendations. Um, it's part of this exercise, of course, that also the um, financial uh, sector, asset owners, investment managers, will be disclosing according to the same framework. Uh, we want to make sure that this is not an additional burden on you, but rather something that you can extract from the reporting that you do uh, to the PRI. So we will try to focus on streamlining uh, this, uh, because no one wants more reporting than necessary. So that was a brief uh, introduction. Hopefully it's uh, clear to everyone that this is highly relevant for investors uh, and you got a small flavor of the activities that the PRI will have to support the framework. Uh, I uh, really hope that our uh, signatories will be active. Uh, just one final uh, thought on this is um, there is, I think there has been a lot of emphasis on how we can create sufficient supply of data. And this exercise is about increasing the supply of relevant data to the marketplace. 
As a PRI, we also have to look at how we create sufficient demand for the data. And that has to do, to a large extent, with the relationship between asset owners and investment managers and how asset owners incentivize their managers to incorporate climate risk in their management. Because that's the uh, way we create demand for this data in the marketplace. And if we want to make better decisions, it's not enough just to increase the supply of data. We also have to look at uh, all the obstacles that are there in terms of creating uh, sufficient demand. So, uh, and that relates to the more general work that we're doing at the PRI on the relationship between asset owners and investment managers and how we can drive responsible investing through the delegated investment chain. So that's my general introduction. Uh, Paul will now say a few words on, uh, from a CDP perspective, and then Jane will take us through uh, the um, exercises. You will see that on your tables you have some uh, papers for taking notes. Um, and uh, just a reminder, uh, please use them. Uh, and leave them on the tables because the PRI staff will collect them and we will use them uh, to get, make sure that we get all of your views uh, into our process on how to follow this up. But Paul, I'll leave it to you now. Th thank you, Martin. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, big thanks to the PRI for, for hosting this session and prioritizing climate change across the conference. Um, it's wonderful to see a packed room first thing in the morning on climate disclosure. That wasn't happening five years ago. Uh, and I think um, you know, the, the FSB task force can really um, take some credit for meaning a room like this is full. Um, it won't surprise you that, having worked at CDP for a long while, I will say that we think uh, disclosure is absolutely fundamental to financial stability and creating a sustainable financial system, a lot of what we were discussing yesterday. Um, before just explaining what we're doing at CDP to implement the task force recommendations, just a, a few reflections uh, on how this really moves climate disclosure forward. Um, I think firstly it's who's doing this, you know, we know who that is, but it's the Financial Stability Board, Mark Carney, Mike Bloomberg and the, the task force members themselves, two of them here, um, at least one or more in the, in the audience. So that's really helped, it's raised this to the next level of conversation. Um, but the real innovations are in the recommendations and three ones that I'm very excited about. Firstly that both corporations and investors, that's all of you in the room, should now be disclosing on climate change. And I think, you know, through CDP we've seen investors encourage thousands of companies to disclose, but I think it's fair to say that the investment community is not yet leading generally at the vanguard of climate environmental disclosure. The corporates you invest in are better at disclosing than yourselves as a community. So this recommendation helps close the loop on climate risk in capital markets. And I think that's very exciting, a little bit challenging, but it's important. Secondly, that the recommendations say where this is material, it should be included in mainstream filings, annual reports. Uh, there's a little bit of that happening now, but very little. And that will really move the climate change agenda more firmly into the boardroom. Uh, and finally, the most exciting recommendation, in my opinion, is really the one for uh, companies and investors to conduct scenario analysis in line with a two degree or below scenario. That's a, a big innovation. There's only a little bit of that going on in the market so far, but with the Paris Agreement, it makes complete sense. The Paris Agreement charts the transition. You as investors, the companies you invest in, need to understand how your strategy aligns with that or doesn't and what that's going to mean for the business. It's pretty obvious, but it's quite cutting edge. Um, so I think this really is going to mean that climate change is an issue uh, and disclosure goes right into the boardroom and that we start to see more companies and hopefully investors aligning their business strategies, their portfolio strategies with a two degree pathway. And we see already through the Science Based Targets Initiative some 305 companies committed to having a strategy in line with or below a two degree pathway. Um, so there's a lot of excitement, just a tiny bit of caution, not wanting to be negative, but these recommendations are voluntary. Uh, we see through CDP, 60% of the market capitalization of the world's 30 largest stock exchanges already discloses. There are some companies that are refusing to disclose at this point. Are they going to disclose in a, in a voluntary system? And secondly, whilst it's incredibly valuable that the task force has focused on financial risk in a material terms to the company and to you as investors, 
does this mean that the financial system will address systemic risk for universal investors from runaway climate change? And I, I, would, I would question that. It's a very positive step forward, but we've got to address both the material direct risk and the systemic risk. A four degree or plus world will create systemic risk for the financial system. That's a big conversation. So um, very much working in partnership with our colleagues at the PRI, we at CDP are working to implement the recommendations of the TCFD uh, into our disclosure platform for 2018. So we're building a new IT system, it will be more robust and more nimble, uh, and then we'll fully adopt the recommendations into that system for next year's disclosure cycle. Um, now, that, the recommendations have a set of uh, all sector recommendations and a set of and sector specific recommendations. Uh, and for next year, we'll have 16 of those sectors covered by the CDP disclosure platform. So I know many of you in the room have pushed CDP to move to sector based disclosure for a number of years. We've experimented that with a little bit, haven't really had the resources. But with the TCFD, um, now we're doing that. So I think that, that will be very exciting. Um, we're also in discussion through the corporate reporting dialogue uh, it, with other sustainability reporting frameworks. Um, Martin said there are 400. I, I, I don't agree with that. There are very few frameworks. There are 400 pieces of uh, recommendations and regulations that imply companies should disclose. That's often a confused message. But we're working with GRI and SASB and others to think, how should we align on the metrics around the TCFD? So I think that is likely to happen in the near future. Uh, and the final thing uh, from CDP perspective is how do we support scenario analysis? There's some good work on this by a few companies. Most companies are saying to us, how should we approach this? What should we do? What is the reference point, reference scenario we should use? And through our work with the Science Based of Targets initiative, which looks at two degree pathways for each sector, and our work uh, on carbon pricing pathways, Mark Carney called for governments to publish carbon pricing corridors. Governments are not publishing carbon pricing corridors, so we're running an exercise with electric utilities and investors. So what do we think the market thinks the corridor of carbon pricing needs to be, uh, implicit or explicit, to drive a two-degree transition? So that work will help inform a scenario, scenario analysis, and there's, there's a lot of work going on on that. So what does this really mean? Uh, certainly from next year, the 6,000 companies who disclose through CDP this year, this 60% of global market cap, will be implementing the task force recommendations in 2018. It doesn't mean they'll do it perfectly. It'll be the first year. We're going to be gentle on everyone. Um, this is a sort of period of experimentation. But we need rapid adoption. Uh, my personal opinion is if we can't sort out climate disclosure as a business norm by 2020, we've got very little chance of keeping the world well below two degrees warming. So well, Christiana said we've got three years to peak emissions yesterday. We've got three years to have really good climate claims disclosure across capital markets in line with the TCFD by 2020. That would be my challenge to all of you. Uh, and, and last week in New York at the World Economic Forum Summit, we launched a new commitment in partnership with We Mean Business and the Climate Disclosure Standards Boards, asking companies and investors to commit to implement the TCFD recommendations within three years. Three years is enough time to do this. Uh, so we, we launched it with just 10 companies who uh, uh, have said they'll do it. Aviva is the first investment company. Um, we'll be encouraging the PRI and all of you as PRI members to make that commitment. It's not difficult. It involves a bit of work. Um, but if you all do it together, we think it will really benefit the financial system. So just to end, and we're going to get onto this in the discussion, what should you as investors be doing? Um, clearly, the thing you should be doing is engaging the companies you invest in to disclose. Most of you are already doing that through CDP. Um, the thing you're not so much doing is doing your own assessments of climate risk and disclosing those. That is really what we want to see. Uh, and this assessment, both of the companies you're investing in and their alignment with the two-degree pathway, but also your own investment and portfolio strategies, are they in line with the two-degree <coughs> pathway? That's going to be critical. That's the scenario analysis assessment. And we really look forward to seeing you do that, helping you do that. Um, and working in partnership with the PRI to, to watch that happen over the next couple of years. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I'm just going to move over here. Um, great. I don't know if any of you uh, saw recently Schroeder's um, published a really, really interesting piece of research called their Climate Dashboard. And they have actually gone into a number of different metrics and committed to tracking those going forward over time. 
to come up with their estimate of, of kind of what world we're tracking towards in terms of overall temperature rise. So they have things like um, political ambition, which as many of us know is about 2.8 degrees, but so far political action takes us towards 3.6. They have good news around coal production, which is online for 2.2 degree warming, but oil and gas investment takes us around 5.3 degrees, and current oil and gas uh, production is 7.8 degrees, the current pathway. So when they, they have 12 of these metrics, when they average them out, it takes us to a, a 4.1 degree world, which as, as Paul mentioned, you know, isn't gonna be a good thing for capital markets. So I, I encourage you to have a look at this study if you haven't as re already, it's, it's really interesting. And it's great to see so many more kind of research firms, investment firms come out with this kind of analysis, which really makes it easier for all of us who are working on this topic to try to kind of bring that together to, to bring it into our own analysis and understanding of how investors can take more action on this. Um, just a couple of quick updates from, the, from what we're doing at, at Mercer. As many of you know, um, we've done a lot of work over the last five years trying to develop forward-looking scenarios and help investors use those to get a sense for how different climate scenarios will impact their you know, opportunities in terms of how different asset classes might be impacted, how sectors will be impacted. Now, we all know that models aren't meant to be perfect. They're meant to be useful. And so from a forward-looking perspective, how can we see the kind of relative impact of different climate scenarios on different kind of perspective investments is really what we're trying to uncover. And we're working on a couple of new kind of things to bring into that. One, and many of you gave us feedback after our, our study in 2015, that it would be good to think about the extent to which the market is already anticipating or expecting different types of climate action. And that's something that I think not all that much work has been done on. But one interesting indicator that would suggest the market's underpricing the potential for a kind of a transition is that we did a survey recently of um, European investors, I think more than a thousand participated, kind of Mercer clients, so more of the kind of smaller mid-size on average investors across Europe. And one of the questions we asked them was, have you thought about climate scenarios and their potential impact on your investment strategy? 5% said yes. So it's really, while many of you in the room and many large investors are looking at this, it's definitely not something that's become kind of mainstream across investment practice. Um, so we're you know, continuing to kind of try to develop our model, think about market, uh, market expectation, how that will influence um, kind of the impact of different scenarios over time. And we've also been working on, instead of looking at the potential average impact of, of different scenarios over time on predicted returns, which is kind of the model we've been using, we had a client who asked us to capitalize that into a shock. So to say, okay, let's look at this more from a stress test perspective. If we bring the impact forward of that anticipated you know, average annual impact over 15 years or 30 years, then what, what are we looking at from that perspective? How could that impact us in the more near term? And how, would that, how does that contrast to other shocks that we may be facing in our portfolio? And then from a risk management perspective, how much focus are we putting on climate versus the other types of risks that we may be anticipating? And are we comfortable with how much focus we're putting on climate risk? And I think in many organizations, climate risk management isn't really a structured function yet where there's a clear process in place and the, and the tools are identified, the teams who are responsible for managing that. And I think that's what we're starting to see, that becoming more commonplace and more structured. And many of, of you in the room are, are working on that. And I think one of the goals with the TCFD is to really encourage that to become much more structured and, and institutionalized. Um, okay, we're gonna do a couple of things now. And I know everyone loves table discussions. So we're gonna move into one of those. Um, but first, we're gonna open up your, um, your apps and just go through the poll for those of you who haven't already filled it in. So if you go to the breakouts, you find this breakout session at the bottom, there's a button that says poll, click on that. And um, here was the first question. Um, so which of, which of you or your clients most use climate change scenarios for? Um, thinking about your total exposure to climate risks and opportunities, looking at a portion of a portfolio's exposure, so looking at a specific asset class or a specific market or sector, looking at how individual companies are exposed to climate-related risks or opportunities, or none of the above. And we're going to come back at the end of the session and look at these results. Um, the next question. 
is around what you're planning to do next year. So again, of those different options, which is the highest priority? Because you can only pick one of those. Um, so we'll go through that. And then the next question is around what the most important development is uh, required in terms of increasing investor utilization of scenarios. And there's a long list here, but you can just pick one in terms of what you think is most important. So you'll see it's around having better tools, having more specific scenarios for investors, uh, guidance around a central or a base scenario. This is something we debated a lot from the task force perspective and ended up kind of pushing people towards the IEA scenarios, but uh, you know, mainly encouraging a two degree or lower scenario without being too prescriptive, recognizing there'll be more development over time, more education for boards or trustees, more education across the industry, or nothing. You know, we're seeing lots of, of good stuff happening and there's, there's no specific area that we need to focus on. And then the last question is around what the PRI should be focusing on particularly. Um, and, and different options here around working to facilitate better access or providing more guidance, building com capacity among investors, or helping investors engage with companies to focus on the TCFD uh, recommendations. So we'll come back to those at the end and see what the, the results were. Uh, now we're going to move into table discussions. So I think you've got about 20 minutes at your table. Uh, to talk about the two questions which are in the middle of your table written uh, in very small font on a piece of paper. Um, so each table is going to need to nominate two people. You need to nominate a moderator and you need to nominate a note taker. And so as Martin said, if the note taker could take notes, uh, identify which question your notes relate to, the PRI is going to gather all those up at the end and uh, synthesize that and, and feed it back to conference participants in some way and use it to inform their strategic planning. So get started. You've got 20 minutes. We'll give you a five-minute warning and we'll be circulating in the room. Okay. Um, okay, everyone. Um, it's uh, great to see so many lively and engaged uh, discussions around the tables, but I think we need to uh, start wrapping up. Hello. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, as I said, great to see these uh, very engaged discussions. Uh, we had some poll questions. Yes, okay, so we're going to run through the poll results. Da, da, da. Okay, which of you, uh, which of these have you and your clients most used climate change scenarios for? Um, so thinking about the total fund, thinking about an individual portfolio, or engaging with companies. So 41% uh, assessing how individual companies are exposed to climate risk. And then 25 and 20% 20 uh, of you, wow, so that's still a, a good number who are thinking about your total fund exposure to climate or within an individual portfolio. And 12% of you have not yet done any of the above. So let's see uh, the next question, um, what you're planning to do in 2018. So clicking forward, technology, perfect. Okay, so it's going to be the same list and we're going to see what the key priorities are for next year. Ah, so half of you are planning to assess your total fund exposure to climate related risks. And then 20, uh, 22 and 24% are going to be looking at your portfolio, an individual uh, portion of the portfolio and looking at how companies are exposed. Presumably that's in addition to the 50% of you who are already looking at company exposure, uh, which would then be 75% of you who are looking at how companies are performing on different climate measures. Somebody said no. Not possible. Okay, what is the most important development needed to increase investor utilization of climate scenarios? Very curious to see what the results are here. Ah, oh, wow, so 44%. Development of more investor-specific scenarios and tools is the clear uh, runaway winner. The second is guidance on a central or base case scenario, but that's only 19%. Huh, interesting. Okay, so development of more investor-specific uh, scenarios and tools. Very interesting. And then the last question, if we can go back, is going to be around what the biggest priority for the PRI should be. So let's see what those results are. So pretty uh, good distribution. 
Uh, so 11% said working to facilitate better in access to scenarios. Uh, the, the winner is 37% uh, develop investor guidance uh, to climate scenarios, and then 20% build capacity among investors on using climate scenarios, and 24% help investors engage with companies to disclose against TCFD recommendations. Very interesting. Uh, well, maybe we'll leave this up because Martin's going to talk about what the PRI is doing next, so this is a, a great segue. Great. Well, I, you know. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thank you. Um, and I've been, been around listening to the conversations, some of the tables, and um, I thought uh, lots of very thoughtful comments. So I hope you really take the time to write down on the, on the papers that you have. Um, after this session is finished, if you have additional comments, questions, um, the PRI staff working on these issues will be up here after the session so you can talk to them. Get, <clears throat> Sorry, get their business cards, send them an email if you have additional comments, questions, ideas for how we can take this work further. But I think it falls in, in, in two broad categories. It's about making sure that uh, you get access to the data and making sure that you can use it. And uh, one of the things, uh, in addition to the things I mentioned earlier, is I think, we think, it will be useful to try to develop some pilot reporting um, in various sectors, because the, the reporting framework is principles-based, so it gives you a sense of the kinds of questions. I think it will be useful both for the disclosures and for the investors to see what a report based on these principles could look like for different sectors. Uh, so that's work that we're trying to, uh, to undertake, and I think uh, that will incorporate this issue of helping you sort of understand and use the climate scenarios because obviously the scenarios will have to be a part of this. Uh, so this is something that we definitely will be working more on. I wanted to ask, we have Curtis Ravenel from Bloomberg also with us. Uh, so Curtis is really the brains behind the whole task force and uh, central person uh, in, in writing the report. I wondered if I could ask you just for a couple of minutes to share some thoughts on, uh, well, some of the issues we had here, but also how you see the work of the task force uh, going further, because the work of the task force is not really complete yet. I, maybe use the lectern, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Um, that is maybe the most generous uh, description of my role ever. Um, brains, not known for brains, more for, despite my small stature, a little bit of brawn, uh, as far as trying to get the collective of people who generally disagree with each other um, in a room to agree on something. And I, I really do think that we ended up in, in the right place. And it'll be no surprise to you all that many of the US uh, or North American folks thought we went a little too far. Um, and the Europeans saw we didn't go far enough, so that's sort of the Goldilocks approach, right? So leaves a little bit wanting for everyone. And I think, as Martin rightly said, it's a principles-based thing. If we had had more, we did not have a lot of time uh, to do our work. And we developed some sort of high-level recommendations and then the sector-specific guidance. But really what's missing, to your point, Martin, is technical guidance, really. Uh, and so there's got to be a lot more work. I think many of us would share the feeling that um, we're disappointed that Governor Carney will be stepping down both from the BOE and as chair of the Financial Stability Board in September of 2018, which is why we, um, our remit, I think, lasts really until 2018. Uh, and this was a, an add-on at the end, really, to say how do we monitor, evaluate, and promote adoption. And we've seen and heard to hear today a fair amount about that, which is really exciting for us because the last thing that we want is this report to sit on a shelf and gather dust. And thanks to the leadership of PRI and CDP and individuals in the room, we really do um, have an opportunity to move things forward. That being said, you know, what is, what, so how do we do that between now and then? As a task force, we're trying to monitor all of the activity and there's just a ton of it. Um, around adoption, and is it going to be a little fragmented and stilted? Perhaps, but I think the most important thing is to get going on it, um, and having CDP and PRI lead very quickly by integrating some of the task force recommendations into their um, reporting uh, tools and so forth is super important. 
Um, I think for us, um, the most important thing is was always to elevate this to the board and senior management level um, to get it on the agenda. People in this room have been working on these for a long time. I think the key is to engage your ecosystem in making sure that they too uh, include these issues um, in basically in all of the interactions that you have throughout your sort of uh, supply chain of information. And so, you know, when we see this, I think really, the, and I thought Paul did a really good job in summarizing sort of the key things, it, it is the scenario analysis bit, this forward-looking bit that's most important. I worry, this is a personal thing, I worry a little too much about the focus on financial filings because I think that that, especially when you're talking about long horizons, you know, does that become material or not? That's going to be in the eye of the beholder. You know, in the world of, in, of the future is not going to matter where you disclose information. I've always focused on financial filings because that was the, the most efficient delivery mechanism to the wide um, and widespread use amongst uh, investors. Um, the materiality question is a sticky one, and I don't want it. To, again, this is a personal opinion. I don't want us to get hung up on on that question um, as an excuse not to disclose. Right, and this as tools improve and as better information becomes available, we'll be able to determine materiality much more efficiently. And so um, experimenting, getting started, doing something as soon as possible to get going is really, really important. And I think we need to be sure, while we encourage disclosure and people to, to get going, that we don't beat people up too early for not doing all of it right out of the gate, right? Because this is, um, some of it's experimental. Um, you know, the task force itself um, really will be putting out a report on sort of the state of the world in September 2018. We do have to think about how we keep this momentum um, alive beyond that. And these groups will do that, but we need to figure out sort of what is, is there a role for the task force outside of the FSB remit or not in the future is sort of what we'll be thinking about and how to institutionalize this work because that's really just the start. The recommendations are really just the start. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I don't know if I missed anything else, Martin. Is that good for you? The only thing I would like to add yes, please. is that um, we will be working a lot through the year. And in September 2019, sorry, 2018, we will have the PRI in person in San Francisco. Yes. In okay. parallel with the governor of California's big climate event that yes. will be going on at the same time. That's right. So it is uh, obvious that climate will be an important part of the PRI in person next year. Yeah. Um, so I hope you'll come back yes. to that event. Maybe we could launch the task force Actually, yeah, we'll summary be having report at report, the PRI yeah. in person uh, uh, next year. Um, but in the meantime, I would really like to encourage all of you in the room, all of our signatories, to engage with us and drive this forward because the PRI cannot drive this forward alone. We, what we do is try to collect the collective wisdom of our signatories and put it together in a form that can be used um, and to help this drive forward. So we really rely on all of you to engage in this issue and work with us as we develop these tools and the understanding. As Curtis is saying, this is really a start of a journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is really, uh, this is where it starts. And we need to make sure that we can work together to fill this with real useful content for investors. So thank you all for, um, for coming. Again, I hope you've written down all your clever thoughts uh, on this paper. Leave them on the tables. And thank you all for your participation. Thank you.